okay, we're talking about pictures. All right, it's uh, Talking Pictures with Kenneth Jureski. Uh Hank didn't give you any of the cuts from the last one where I said that about 100 times. I was like, okay, it's Talking Pictures with Kenneth Jureski. Am I pronouncing your name right, Ken? Yeah, you're pronouncing it right. Do you go by Ken? <laughs> Ken or Kenneth? I go by Ken. All right, nice. All right, so we're here on our first episode of this podcast. What do you want to talk about? We want to talk about you and your career and how you got started. You got started, unlike me, you got started kind of late in life or late in the uh, photography world's life. You, uh, you started completely on digital and you learned kind of online too. Yeah. So tell me how that went. Okay. So how I started off uh, in photography was to begin with, my dad was a pretty serious amateur landscape photographer. So I kind of grew up around the DSLR, uh, SLR initially, and then later DSLR world. We would go on family trips and stuff and I would shoot pictures with him. You know, every trip w that we could take would be about trying to make landscape pictures somewhere. So we would do that. We went all around to different national parks and whatnot. Then later in life, you know, I was always kind of told, don't be a photographer. You know, there's, not, there's no career in photography, like do something safe. So I was going to school and doing all that thing. And finally, one time I took a trip with my family from India after I got married and I shot a million pictures on a little point and shoot camera. And I decided, okay, I gotta actually buy a decent DSLR and start taking good pictures. Just for the simple fact of, I want to capture these moments, these memories and things that have, have a good picture to rely on. So I bought with my student loan money, a Canon 7D. And then from there, I just, you know, how's that it was like student YouTube. loan working out for you? What's that? How's that? How's that student loan debt working out for you at this point? It's not working out that great right now. <laughs> so was it a good was it a good investment using your student loan money to buy a camera? Money to buy a camera? I don't think it, no. It definitely I, I I highly doubt that it will ever pencil out on paper. Um, obviously, I think it was worth it. Um, but no, it's not something that I would recommend for people to do. That's for damn sure. Okay, I just want to yeah, I don't want to have to have any uh, disclaimers on this. Exactly, exactly. But uh, so I, I got that. Uh, as soon as I got the camera, you know, I just became obsessed with photography. At that point, it was just learn everything I could learn about the camera. And where'd you go to learn? That's the, where'd you go to learn? How did you learn? So the first place I went was I read the manual from start to begin, from start to finish. You know, I learned everything about the camera. Then I would search like online manuals. Canon had like, you know, the 7D, how to set up this, how to set up that, how to do video. And then from there, I would go to YouTube. This was in the era of YouTube. Um, and I would start to learn things, you know, little technical things here and there. And then the big source of learning for me was Creative Live. And when I found Creative Live at the time, I mean, they had only had a couple of classes available at that point but they were really rolling out with a lot more. And so they would show these workshops, online live workshops for free. And then once the live recording was over after two or three days, whatever the workshop was, you'd have to pay for it if you wanted to, if you wanted to be able to watch it again. So you basically learned everything about photography online. Basically, I mean, I had some, I mean, I had looked at probably, you know, 50,000 four by six prints by the time I was 12 years old of my dad's, you know, from every single trip we would, sh he would shoot 50 rolls of film and then take it to like Walgreens, Walmart, Sam's club, wherever. And we'd get like these stacks of prints back and I would look through those. So that would be where I'd say I learned, you know, basic things about composition and training my eye. But as far as actually being able to make pictures myself, yeah, it was a hundred percent online. 100% online. And then, and then I, I would say too, trial and error too. I mean, I, I would learn something online. Then I would run outside across the street in the park, take my dog out there, make him, you know, try to take pictures of my dog. Um, then I got to a point where, you know, after I had kind of the technical side down to where I could actually think about setting out and making a picture, I would 
spend, you know, almost two hours a day with my dog in this, in this like off leash dog park place with cliffs and streams and all this. And I would just be running around out there with my camera on a tripod, just trying to shoot anything and everything that, that moved, you know, and I did that for a good year for sure. You know, I got in great, great shape. I was hiking all the time with my dog and I was super into landscape photography. So how long ago was that? How, what, what type, what type of time frame are we talking about? Was that seven years ago? You said you were using a 7D. So that's like, that's like seven or eight years ago, right? It would have been just about 10 years ago, almost exactly 10, 10 years ago. Okay. And then, so you were in school at the time, you know, you got the student loan. And what were you studying? I was studying political science. Uh, I was getting a PhD. Okay, in and how far science. along did you get along with that? How far? How far did you get into that? Well, I was in a PhD program. You graduated. You were in the PhD program. So you were teaching at that point. You were doing uh, assistant professor duties. What were you doing? Yeah. So I was pretty. I was probably good. I was probably like my third year, fourth year of grad school. So at that time, you're mostly just. Um, doing teaching. So you've assistant. been in school like eight years now, seven, eight years. How long have you been in school? At that point, at that point in the PhD program, I was in the third or fourth year. So I had an undergrad before that for four years. So we're so talking like eight seven, years. seventh year of like post high school. Okay. And so when did you get your PhD? I never did. <laughs> I never finished it. Why didn't you get your PhD? You're eight years in. I was, I was eight years out of high school, man. I wasn't eight years into a PhD. I was only, I was only You're like eight four years or five into, years into, into higher education. You're eight years into higher education. And so you, there's an investment there. Not just, you know, with student loans. There's an investment. Totally, totally. Investment in time and lots of, lots of resources for sure. Um, and so... The reason why I ultimately didn't get the PhD was I got hired at a, uh, in grad school. So when you, when you get to the point of where you're what is called ABD, all but dissertation, then you can get hired at university. So I got hired at a university in Texas and I was like, okay, you know, I can get a job. Just to be clear, you've got, you've got a real job now. You're almost got your PhD. A tenure track job, you know, so I'm finishing my first uh, year of teaching, like getting paid, you know, legitimate money and everything. And I decide at that point, uh, that summer is sort of like make it or break it time. Like if I want to continue with this career, I got to spend the summer and finish my PhD. Or if I want to get out of political science and do photography full time, then now's the time for me to jump ship. And I started thinking about this in probably about the first two so weeks. So you, you were a summer, one summer away from your PhD? one summer away basically i was okay. probably and was, and you and you decided to buy a canon 7d no 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 i had already had the 7d no i had the 7d for years before this before i made this decision i had i had the camera like two years or three years to make this decision to throw away your phd yes i had i had bought the camera i was still finishing up coursework you know i had a lot of time as a student so i was learning about shooting so you didn't just throw away all that higher education on a whim. It took like three years. It took like three years. It took me going through, I applied for a hundred jobs in political science, got one interview, you know? So it took some rough times where it was like, oh, hey, this, this PhD route and job that I, you know, had signed up for isn't necessarily all that it's cracked up to be, you know? And then, and then lo and behold, I finally. So you're saying it's hard. You're saying a political science degree, it's hard to get a job. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, yeah, but not just with a political science degree. Talking like basically any type of thing. I mean, compared thing, to academia. getting a job in photography, is it harder, or is it about the same? Just, I just want to, I want to clarify. Is it harder to get a job in it, it, with a PhD than it is to work in? Um. Looking back at the time, I thought I thought for sure it'd be easier to be a photographer. You thought this is a good plan. <laughs> That's for damn sure. I was like, I was like, oh man, it would be so much easier to be a photographer. Like I would, I could work anywhere. I don't just have to take the. Why did you think it was going to be so easy to be a photographer? Why did you think that? I thought that you know it was something that I could do anywhere. 
you know? So I thought for me, it was all about the geography of being stuck. Like I, I got this job in East Texas, you know, and it was the only place that would hire me in the entire country. And the idea of basically saying that my fate of where I'm going to live is going to be dictated by what job is available, where, and who's going to be willing to give someone with a Missouri PhD a job, you know? And so I get stuck in East Texas. And so I'm like, Hey, if I, well, if you I went to the university of Missouri, you, you you went to the University of Missouri? Yeah, man. PhD? PhD in Missouri, yeah. You didn't know that? No, I knew it. I'm just I just wanted to make yeah, make it perfectly clear <laughs> that that you, you grew don't support up in Nebraska me. and you went to Missouri to get a PhD in political science. And why did I go to Missouri? That's the that's the other question. Same same reason why I went to East Texas. They were the only place that would have me. <laughs> So, 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 so the bottom line is you don't have a PhD in, um, no, I just have a master's science or I got a master's. anything for that matter. Nope. You no got PhD. a master's. Great. Okay. So I got a master's. And so then you decided to be a photographer and, and you learned online, you learned completely online for the most part. Right. Yep. So I'm in my, I get hired down there in Texas at this small school. And in the, within the first two weeks, I'm, I know, I know for a fact, like, okay, I thought, okay, I'll try this. I got the job. Like maybe, maybe now that I've got this job, it'll, it'll be cool again and it'll be fun again and everything. And within two weeks, I know there's no way I can do this for the rest of my life. So, I mean, at that point it was, I was, I was mentally going all in. Before I even took this job, I was ready to quit political science and do photography full-time. I'm seriously doing a photo shoot, and someone calls me and says, hey, are you still interested in this job in Texas? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess. And then I happen to do the interview, get the job. You what know, kind whatever. of photo shoot were you doing? I was doing a shoot for one of my mom's friends. I was doing, like, a portrait shoot for one of my mom's friends and her kid. Oh, man, I got the pictures. You should see them, man. They're great. So it was a paid job, though. It was a paid job. You're getting paid. Yeah, it was like a hundred bucks or something, you know. Make a portrait of my mom's friend and her and her kid, and then uh, anyway. So, so it was a hundred bucks. So yeah, it was kind of like, paid. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was like a friend thing, you know, basically. So, so, so you abandon eight years of college, and now you're going to be a photographer. So let me, yeah, that's where I'm getting to. So I get there, I'm two weeks in, I'm like, this is going nowhere. I'm, I got to, and so I go all in mentally on photography, which I was already pretty much really close to that edge before I took this job. And so at that point, it's like 24 seven creative live is running in the background on all my computers. I've got audio of creative live playing everywhere. I'm hearing these photographers talking about portrait photography, this wedding photography, that I go meet up with a wedding photographer. I think, okay, wedding photography, that's where I can make money. I can make a business. So I go, I link up, I message some wedding photographers, email them and meet up with one. And she agrees to let me be her second shooter. Okay. I had shot one wedding up. I had actually shot two weddings up to that point. Okay. One was for $500 back in Columbia, Missouri. One was my cousin's wedding. That was like a, a two years prior to that for no money. So she agrees to let me be her second photographer. End up, like I said, 24 seven, if I'm not doing the bare essentials of my professor job, then, and I'm not, then I'm, I'm, I'm learning about photography. I'm like strategizing business, listening to business podcasts and, um, and shooting weddings. Like every weekend we would shoot like a wedding or two weddings sometimes. I probably shot 20 weddings with her, you know, something like that. Then my wife, so now you're at least you're you're learning hands on from another photographer. You're at least having some personal interaction at this point. Yep, exactly. And with clients too. I mean, like that's that's a big thing. I mean, up to this point, I'm really shooting a handful of friends as far as portrait stuff is concerned, um, and not not really interacting with clients almost at all. You know, just interacting with friends and family that want pictures and stuff like that. You know. So this was the first time where I was like, okay, this is like an actual business. She was a, she was a pretty serious businesswoman. I mean, she made pretty good money shooting weddings. She shot a lot of weddings, but you know, she probably brought down a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, on her weddings. And so to me, that was pretty inspirational as far as just like seeing how she operated her business, how to shoot a wedding, how to interact with people, with clients, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I definitely learned a lot from her. I probably had about 
maybe six or eight months uh, working with her. And then, like I was saying, is that my, we decided, okay, my wife is also a political scientist, studies the same thing. So we kind of made the calculated decision of it's, if we're going to go someplace where they're going to be able to hire both of us, then we're not going to be able to pick where we go. So, but maybe she by herself can get a job somewhere that we would actually want to live. And last minute, this job opened up in Montana, in Billings, Montana, and she applied for it and got it. And so, and that was probably, it was probably April that she applied. We found out in May that she got it. And by July, we were moving, you know? So all of a sudden, what I thought was going to be like a two-year plan or maybe a three-year plan, learn weddings and get a bunch of them under my belt and build a portfolio and this and that, all of a sudden it was we're moving to Montana and you've got the opportunity now to start your business a hundred percent from scratch, you know, and, and be done with political science forever. So, so that's when I, that's when I officially a hundred percent jumped ship, but there was, there was a good, you know, for, so you jump ship, you like jump ship in like the Cortez model where you literally jump ship and then burned your boats. Cause there's no going back. At kind this of. Point. Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, I had that summer um, to finish my dissertation, you know, and I could continue, you know, I could keep dragging that on longer and longer if I wanted to. But I told my, my advisor kept calling me and I just finally told him, I was like, look, man, I was like, I'm up here in Montana. I'm trying to get my business going. Like, I just can't justify spending two months working on my dissertation when I know like this is where my heart is. This no, is I mean, after eight years, how could you possibly justify that? Yeah, exactly. Two months, exactly. I couldn't. I couldn't do another two months, man. That was that was ridiculous. <laughs> no, so <laughs> just. I just want to be clear. I just want to see you know your mindset at the time. No, that's exactly how it was. Um, it was basically it was an obsession. It was push and pull. That's why I always say that there were factors in the career, academia career that were pushing me away, things I didn't like about it. Like once I finally was at the end of the road and I could see the, the light at the end of the tunnel and I got the job and everything, I didn't like it, you know? So I kind of was like, hey, I know what the end of this is. I don't necessarily have to have the piece of paper in my hand. I mean, I already had the job, you know, to, and I knew, so I knew that I didn't want to do it anymore, you know? Um, and then the pull factors were, I was just addicted. I was 100% like um, obsessed with photography. I mean, it was 24-7. Like who was your who was your favorite photographer at that time? Like Avedon, Irving Penn. No, no, I didn't know. I didn't even know Avedon or Irving Penn at that time. Um, if I could try to think, I knew I knew uh, Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams was probably my favorite. Like Ansel Adams, you know Ansel Adams. Yeah, yeah. What's that? Yeah, Ansel Adams. Okay. Yeah, that was that was Edward Weston. Edward Weston. Yep, I knew him, and that was about it as far as legit photographers the people i learned business from were like wedding photographers on creative live you know sue bryce was one on on creative live that i that i learned you know i was like oh what's this like glamour portrait stuff i was like i kind of like that you know i watched a lot of her uh workshops on creative live i remember watching her very first one and you know everyone's like crying at the end and stuff and uh yeah i mean so so the sue bryce was probably like one of my biggest inspirations at that time you know, as I was transitioning from being a landscape photographer who pretty much only cared about like Ansel Adams and taking hikes in mountains and stuff, every trip I would go, you know, every, every holiday from school, I would go to Colorado and go to the mountains and try to do landscape pictures and stuff like that. And like I was saying, I would spend two hours almost every day hiking with my camera on a tripod with my dogs uh, up and down these cliffs and hills and streams in this big dog park area. And, uh, as preparation for like, you know, when I do get to spend those five days in Colorado, I'm not going to be like too tired to hike up the hill and do the sunset picture or whatever. You know, I was, I was going to be ready. You know, uh, I was going to have my camera settings. I would know everything about how to operate my camera, like with my hands are freezing cold in the winters in Missouri and the sweaty heat and the summers in Missouri, you know? So, so that was like all of my preparation up to that point. And then I had only really started shooting people maybe my last year or so that I was at in Missouri. Um, and that's when I kind of realized like, oh, like if you want to actually make a living and not just have this as a hobby, like you have to shoot people, you know, like weddings, birthdays, port senior portraits, 
uh, graduations. Okay, okay. So, so it was kind of out of a desire to make a business that I started going into that direction. Um, and so as far as influences in that direction, I didn't have any, I didn't know in Irving Penn. I didn't know Avedon. I didn't know any of that. I knew Sue Bryce and like a handful of other, you know, random people that were on creative live selling workshops. So you think that's common? You think that you were pretty in this in digital era learning online? Do you think that's your kind of standard as far as you know learning and that's how other people learn they learn from uh, modern day influencers and they they kind of uh miss the uh the masters 100 percent, man that's exactly why you know i always say that you know i was on this trajectory at the time that was just pretty flat you know and i was maybe going to be a decent wedding photographer but then when I met you and, you know, you turned me on to the greats and, you know, showed me your library of books and taught me about the history of photography, then I realized how little I actually knew for those previous five years or so. I was just basically spinning my wheels. Okay, so, the, but, you know, there's this, there's this, it's not a theory, it's like a, it's, 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 well, I guess it is technically a theory, it might be a law. But this idea that people, um, the less expertise they have at a, at a, at a certain discipline, the less um, knowledge they have to determine if they're any good at that discipline. So because the, the, the knowledge to become an expert at something is is the same knowledge you need to know if you're an expert or not at something. So what did you do, do, just looking back? And so this is what maybe five years ago at this point. Okay. So looking back on a scale of one to 10, what was your self perception of how good of a photographer? You were? Oh my God. <laughs> at the time, at the time I was a very solid seven or eight. I mean, and, uh, I mean, if 10 is Avedon, I was probably like a seven. But you didn't know who Avedon was. So let's say 10 is Sue Bryce. Yeah. You know, I was probably like a seven, you know, that I was, I was, I thought I was pretty hot shit. I mean, I've never been one to lack in confidence. So, but, um, I mean, you, you met me. Remember the first time that we met and we like had a drink together. I mean, I probably, I probably didn't come off as someone who was like, you know, didn't have a clue. You know, I, I thought I had everything figured out, you know, at that point when I met you. <laughs> Not so crazy to think of looking back on that, you know. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, at that point, I mean, I remember when sitting down with Ken, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm already a successful photographer here, you know. And it was only in, like, seeing you and then comparing myself to you that I was like, oh, wow, like, I'm, I'm really, like, pretty much nothing as far as photography is concerned, you know. So, so even now, I mean, I'd rank myself on the scale of one to 10, a one, you know, if Avedon is 10, I'm a one, you know? Um, and so, yeah, but I mean, not that I, I still don't like, well, that's, confidence. that's the, that's the other, that's the other side of the, the, the theory is that the better you get, the, the, uh, more expertise you have, the less you, you consider yourself an expert. So that's actually a good sign to, to uh, underestimate your skills. Yeah, exactly. I think like, once, once you become really good at something, then you start to see like how little you actually know about it. You know, once you get past that surface level and you see that, wow, there's a whole earth under here, then you realize, you know, you're, you're not really what you thought you were. And then you realize also you learn, like you were saying before, an expert is someone who also knows what they don't know, you know? You have to be smart enough as an expert to know, you know what you know and you know what you don't know and you are trying to get from point A to point B. You know, how can I master that stuff that I don't know? So, so yeah, but um, definitely now, now I'd say I probably have the opposite problem where I think like pretty much unless you're one of the best doing it, then you might as well just like forget about it, <laughs> you know? So, so now I have the opposite problem. So at that point, 
when we first met five years ago, you were uh, the way to success was paying gigs, and those are basically weddings or portraits or you know that kind of which probably ninety five percent of photographers that's how they do make a living. What uh, when you when you when you picked up a magazine? I mean, you've always been into sports. You pick up Sports Illustrated. Did you ever think where did these photos come from? Um, not really. I remember there's a Sports Illustrated cover with Tom Osborne being carried off the field, you know, after a national championship. And I always had that sitting on my desk or sitting around in my room, you know, as a kid and then growing up through grad school and stuff. And no, I mean, even to this day, I don't know who shot that picture, you know? So no, I was not aware of it at all. I mean, photography was just sort of it was one thing, you know, I did grow up with a, with a father with a camera in his hand a lot of times, you know? So, I mean, I kind of always had this, I knew where the pictures were coming from, but I never had any curiosity beyond that, really. You know, I just thought, oh, you know, that guy was in a great place at, a, at the right time, you know, and he got that awesome picture at Sports Illustrated. If someone put a camera in my hand and let me get in that position, I'd probably be able to do the same. Like, that was probably my attitude at that time. So you've made some pictures of tom osborne since then do you still have that idea that you know if you're there if you got the uh, sideline credential that uh you if you're, you're there you can make the picture um you know you know me all too well ken with these leading questions like this <laughs> no i definitely do not think that now if i just simply you know you give me a nice camera and put me there give me a sideline pass and i'll be able to make that picture no Definitely not. Um, it's so much harder than sports photography in particular is just like way harder than I have ever imagined that it would have been. Uh, my dad used to shoot, we, I would race motocross. And so he would be out there uh, taking pictures of, of motorcycles as they jump across on these jumps and stuff. And then my stepmom would get the four by sixes and we'd come back next week and they'd have a pile of four by sixes sitting there and they'd sell them for like two bucks each, you know, to the, all the different racers and stuff. And I remember thinking, oh, man, these pictures are so boring. Like, it must be so easy. Like, you know, I, th I remember thinking, like, racing the motorcycle is the hard part. Like, taking the picture is pretty easy. And then, uh, no, fast forward to I'm on the sideline and Tom Osborne's there and other, you know, and, it, and no, it's much more difficult to do. Much easier said than done. There's a specific art to it for sure. Um, even now, as a, as a good I would call myself a photographer, you know, not a sports photographer or a wedding photographer or any kind of photographer, just an overall photographer. And I would say for anyone who is, you know, adequate with a camera, try going and shooting a high school football game or something like that. It is much, much more difficult than you would ever imagine. So no, now my level of respect is way high. Um, so yeah, I need to go, I need to pull that magazine out. Uh, I'm rearranging some magazines at home and and see who actually shot that. You probably know. No, I got a guess, but I'm not going to say. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure who shot it, but I don't want to just throw a name out there. Um, so let's talk about your first. So, so you're in that track. You're in that, that uh, local photographer um, track. So your weddings, portraits, whatever you can get. And you're, you're, you're designing a business. You're taking good advice from these people do know their business, like Sue Bryce. They know how to make a living with a, with a camera yeah. doing that kind of work. At what point what, was your, your first editorial job ever? Was that the Kenny Bell cover? Yep, that was my first. Um, technically, technically, no. Um, I did have one thing happen uh, with that wedding photographer in Texas. Um, there was like some local, like whatever magazine, like East Houston wedding Chronicle magazine or whatever it was. And, uh, they wanted us to do a portrait of this, of this woman that was like, I don't even know what it was exactly. Actually, no, it was a women's, it was a, uh, East Texas women's magazine. And it was just a portrait of this woman. And I was her second shooter, you know, and, and, uh, I ended up making the picture that went on the cover of that shoot. So that was the first one. So fast forward, like probably two years later to the Kenny Bell shoot would be my second one. So your, your first, like kind of 
hardcore editorial assignment was shooting uh, for a regional sports magazine. You shot uh, uh, a cover of uh, of a Nebraska football player. Yeah, a star wide receiver that had broken a lot of uh, school receiving. I'm the guy who assigned you to do that. I didn't realize that was your first real editorial shoot. So you didn't know that that was kind of throwing you into the deep end of the pool. How, uh, tell me that, that, uh, how that went through your brain. Well, (laughs) you definitely threw me into the deep end. Um, I was pretty scared. I was nervous. I was a huge, you know, I'm still a huge fan of Nebraska football. So for me, it's like meeting a celebrity, you know, I got sweaty palms. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, as far as the gear I'm using, um, the lighting setup and all of this, I had had my own studio for maybe six months at that point. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but you know, I've been doing some lighting tests and whatnot. I had, uh, I knew how to use a beauty dish and things like that, but I didn't really know very, I wasn't that great on the technical side. And then to cap it off, um, I didn't know I was going to be getting that, that cover shoot. So I had gone back to Nebraska just to watch two games as a spectator. And right before I left, I left my camera bag in Billings, Montana purposely because I didn't have any shoots and it was a huge, it was a huge bag. I mean, it would, I would, I would almost have like a sore back from carrying it around through airports and stuff because I had a couple of, Canon bodies in there and a bunch of big Canon lenses and stuff. So you call me up on like the Tuesday after the game, uh, or maybe the Monday, and we're like, "Hey, we got, th- we want you to do this cover shoot like on Wednesday or Thursday or something." And I'm like, "You're like, you got your cameras with you, right?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, sure." <laughs> or maybe I, maybe I was, I was uh, honest and said no, but I can borrow my dad's or my uncle's or something. You know, ended up borrowing my uncle's camera for that shoot who had the same, I think it was a 5D Mark II or something. And uh, then John Peterson helped us out with the uh, lighting and stuff. He brought all the lighting and everything and helped was like kind of assist me on the day, how to turn on the lights, how to hook up all the remotes, all that kind of stuff. That was kind of the stuff I wasn't super, because I didn't have my gear and and everything. I I was pretty nervous about little things like the remote that's going to fire the the flash. You know, is it going to work or is it not going to work? You know, and, um, but I knew you had prepped me really well going into that shoot on what the concept was. We had a lot of reference material. Um, I had gotten clothing and wardrobe and stuff for Kenny to wear in the shoot as well. So we had a clear, pretty clear look that we were going for. And I was able to talk it through with you on the cover that we wanted to do, you know, how to light it so that it would look the way we wanted. It was basically split lighting, you know, and figured out, okay, it's going to be split lighting of a tight headshot for a cover. And then we want these other type of pictures for the inside of the magazine. And it was all just sort of Rembrandt side light stuff, you know? So that was, I was pretty straightforward on, but I had never interacted with someone of that status before. I had never done a shoot where, you know, you're only going to have two minutes. I was used to being able to have my friend or family member pose for two hours to get one good picture, you know, while I run them around in different lighting and, you know, kind of like, uh, shoot a billion pictures and hope that you get one good one sort of situation. This would going to be where, Hey, I'm only going to have two or three minutes and have to pull off a shoot. So no, I was, I was pretty scared. I was scared shitless. That's for damn sure. I was probably calling you on the drive in drive out. You know, I was super nervous. I mean, just to, just to reflect on that, we had, you basically, we figured out his clothes size. You went to a clothing store. We kind of knew the guy. And he gave you whatever you wanted. You had lights from John. You had a camera bag, a camera from your uncle. Uh, I thought you borrowed another camera too. I actually um, bought, I bought a Sony that, that day when I talked to you, but uh, I had it as a backup because I'd never shot it, done a shoot with it before. So I didn't want to use it. And so that was, uh, I didn't realize that was your first, uh, not only a cover shoot, but it was your first editorial shoot. And I think we, uh, we did uh, dual covers. We did two separate covers. And yeah. I think we probably had, we opened on a double truck. And I think we had another double truck and probably two other half page pictures, right? So, um, yeah, with the, 
yeah, with the cover, I'd say there's probably like six, maybe six pictures printed, um, including the, including two covers. I mean, so maybe seven, um, cause there was a double cover and yeah, I mean, it was awesome. Um, and so just to kind of talk about that for a second, I mean, at that point in my career as a photographer, I was shooting weddings and I was sh making decent money shooting some, some solid weddings. I mean, I had a smart business plan where I, th the very first wedding that I booked in Montana, I charged six thousand dollars for that for that wedding, you know. So I wasn't I wasn't doing like five hundred dollar weddings and stuff at that time, or like shooting kids' birthdays and stuff. Like I had some high pressure jobs. I mean, these were some pretty expensive um, weddings that I was shooting up to that point, and you know, weddings are kind of have that pressure level to them and stuff. So I mean, that's why I probably gave off the air of confidence to you that you thought, oh, you know, he's capable of doing this job. You know, even though, even though you didn't see like a resume or let me see like what you've gotten in print in the past or anything like that, you didn't ask me any of those questions. You, you just knew that I could handle it. Well, I did, it wasn't your air of confidence. I mean, just to be totally honest, that's pretty easy to see through, but I'd seen your, your images that you were making, you were shooting a lot of portraits, you were shooting in the studio. It was a pretty, the, the concept was pretty, was solid and it was pretty straightforward. Um, yeah. So it wasn't all that difficult. And you, you, I don't know if you knew Kenny at that point, but you know, you knew who he was and everything. So um, I wasn't, I, you know, it was, it was a pretty, it was a pretty uh, straightforward shoot. It wasn't, you know, they're never easy. People think, you know, they're easy, Absolutely. but they, they're because there's unforeseen circumstances and weird things happen. You've got, uh, you know, whenever you're working with a, an athlete or a celebrity, you got other people that want to get into the into the conversation and, and put their spin on it. Uh, and then you're dealing with a publisher and a, a general uh, managing editor and a you know, the creative director and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of uh, chefs in that kitchen. But uh, let's go ahead and, so now it's five years later and you just finished, it was about a week ago, you just finished uh, another editorial shoot, which was probably 70 or 80 portraits, something like that. 92, 92 players. Um, it was for the entire Nebraska football team over a period of three days, um, minus a handful of guys that weren't in town and whatnot. So I think there might be like 110 or 15 on the roster, but, um, yeah, 92 guys in three days, uh, working for that same magazine, you know, that you initially got me started with, with that Kenny Bell shoot. Um, this was the fourth year in a row that I've done this shoot, um, with the full shooting, the full football team in the spring. And. Yeah, I uh, just got back from that. Uh, it was it was crazy. It's always really chaotic. Um, but definitely, as it, as I've done that shoot four times, um, you kind of go through that same phase where the first one, I didn't really realize what I was getting myself into. And I was kind of like, ignorance is bliss. You know, like I thought it was super amazing. Everything was turned out great, even though I was really stressed and freaked out about it. Then the third and fourth ones are kind of like where you maybe overthink a little too much. You know, you get to that point where, where things slow down and you start to overcomplicate things because you can, you know, that sort of thing has started happening. But this time it was probably the easiest and I was probably the happiest with the pictures of all four times I've done it. And I think that's just kind of getting to that level of maturity where I knew walking in what I wanted. I knew how to get it. I knew I was going to get it from the players. Um, and it was basically just a matter of, can I sustain this energy level for three days straight, long days, you know, like, like 10, 12 hour days. Can I sustain a really high level of energy for, for three days in a row like that? You know, if I can, I knew I would get it, you know? So this is, this is a cover too. You, it's, are they pulling a cover out of this take? So you got a cover. You've got uh, how many pages usually in sites? About 60 pages, 70 pages? Yeah, about 60, I'd say. Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, a three-day shoot, 92 players. 
you're shooting for a cover, 60 pages inside where, you know, what are we going to, what are we going to have? Maybe 40 different images. Yeah. Something like that. 40. Um, it depends on how many can go as double trucks. I think in the previous, the previous issue, I had a lot of double trucks. I mean, there might've been 10 double trucks. Um, and so, you know, that, that, uh, that was pretty cool this time. Um, we'll see how many double trucks there are. You know, it just worked out really well last time that, that I could get double trucks based on the set I had. But, um, but yeah, so this time it might be a little bit more, a lot of uh, single page full images because they're kind of more portrait oriented. But yeah, um, so that, there's a lot of pressure on these shoots, on that shoot in particular, because you get each player for about two to three minutes. You know, if you have a relationship with them, if you can coax them into staying you might get four minutes you know if someone's not watching over us to make sure that they're they're getting off of our sets you know these players are always accompanied by uh people from the university so there's a lot of moving parts there's a lot of things that go into it and um it's very very stressful but like i said this time i was probably the most confident that i've ever been going into it because i the concept was nailed down in advance i knew exactly what i was doing it was just a matter of um, whether I could pull the lighting off and then keep up the energy for three days. Once I got the lights set, you know, all the stress was off and it was just, now we're just going to shoot for three days. Okay, so say they shoot. So now, you know, used to be interacting with the people, getting them, like, I used to be so concerned about posing. Like, I would, I, I would buy Sue Bryce's posing uh, guide. And I would, I would have them print it off when I would go to like these wedding, like engagement shoots and stuff and be like, oh, do this and do that, you know, five, five years before. And so in the first year I did these shoots, it was like, oh my God, how am I going to get these guys to pose? You know, but after doing it for a while, this time I thought by the time this one came around, it was like, that's the easy part. The shooting is the easy part. It's just like the setup, the technical, the lighting and everything like that. Now I've got the skill over how to interact with people and players and stuff to the point that, you know, camera in my hand, make a portrait of someone. That's like, that's simple. It's all the other moving parts around it that are, are much more difficult. So uh, at this point, are you using uh, Avedon's guide to posing or Irving Penn's? Oh, no, they didn't, they didn't do one of those. Oh, no, no. I mean, we, we should make an Avedon guide to posing. I bet we'd make a million dollars. What, uh, out of these 40 images that the magazine will probably publish, maybe they, maybe they publish 50 and plus the cover. How many, uh, how many frames did you send them? I sent them about 3000. You sent 3000, 3000 images to the magazine. 3000 proofs. Yeah. To call down to 50 at the high end. 50 images, 3,050. How many did you shoot? It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000. <laughs> there, there, there's something so wrong with that. You know that, right? I do know that. I do know that. Uh, getting back to some of my weaknesses. Uh, so, so that's definitely one of my weaknesses is that I overshoot. Uh, no, no question about it. If you ask me, like, what's, what's your greatest weakness as a photographer? Overshooting uh, is a problem for me. How do you even look at that? I mean, that's like... What... This shoot in particular uh, was extremely high. And there was a reason for it because there was a way of... Uh, there was a thing I was trying to do with using a really wide-angle lens and getting their arms really close to the camera. And to create like all this weird distortion and like this, this real like depth to the image where the hand is very close to the camera and the face is far away. So it's all stretched out with a long, with a wide lens. And so they would have to be waving their hands around close to the camera, close to the lens and things like that. And I would be just like firing off shots. So a little bit of an excuse, uh, for having 15,000, but I would have probably still had 10,000. I probably do 10,000 every year anyway, you know? Um, so that definitely added to the number, but I know I got a problem with overshooting. That's for damn sure. So, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm surprised my alien bees could handle that many. 
shots, you know, all my lights, none of my lights blew up. Um, you know, I don't know. It worked. It worked out. It was, it was, it was a lot of work to go through 15,000 pictures. And that's why I basically partially pawned it off on them that they're going to have to go through the remaining 3,000. Hey, hey, this battery's right here. You, uh, you ever hear what, uh, you ever, you ever hear, you see this movie with Dustin Hoffman and, uh, Lawrence Olivier, that was, uh, that was his name. And it's, uh, it, it's, uh, there's a torture scene in the movie where Lawrence Olivier tortures Dustin Hoffman. And Hoffman, you know, the method actor, he didn't sleep like for 24 hours before the scene and he was exhausted and he looked terrible, which was, you know, perfect for the moment in the film. But uh, at some point, Laurence Olivier says, you know, young man, why are you doing this to yourself? Why don't you just try acting? So I guess what I'm saying is there's a difference between Shooting and seeing, looking and seeing. I mean, yeah. when you're shooting that much, how do you see? The biggest problems that happens when you start shooting that much, you know, you, you start, things start going too fast and you don't slow down and actually see what you're, what you're shooting. So I think, and, and are you, you chimping can, it, at the same time? It inhibits. Am I what? Are you chimping right along with that? No, that's one thing. That's one thing that I don't do is I don't chimp. I don't look at the back of my camera very much. Um, and so, no, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm interacting. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I like to have the technical side of things like done before the person walks on set so that when I'm on set, it's me and the person. And it's an ebb and flow between us. You know, it's like the dance between us. And that's it. And I'm just trying to make sure I'm just firing off shots. I mean, there's certainly times where I, when I... So you're like Austin Powers out there. You're, you're literally dancing with the subjects? Literally uh, dancing. <laughs> I'm doing whatever it takes. Like when I was shooting this Wyclef show recently, I was literally dancing while I was on stage. And, and uh, I was downtown Boise afterwards at, the, at this pizza place. And one of the sound guys was there and he's like, he's like, yo, photographer. He's like, yo, yo, I saw you dancing. I saw you dancing while you were, uh, you know, shooting. Like, aren't all the pictures going to be blurry or something like that? I'm just like, no, man, I got it. I was like, but you know, I mean, yeah, I was interacting, you know, that's how it is. I mean, that, that's a, for some people, it's sort of like, that's, that's my strength is my ability to interact with the person and really like be a part of it. Um, as far as vision, like, I think that's my greatest weakness. Like I've got so far to go on, on developing my vision. Like that's one thing where I, when I look at you and whenever I shoot with you or watch you shoot so much more deliberate, you know, I'm more of like trying to make things happen in front of me and then like scrambling to catch it on, on film, you know, that's more of like my style as a photographer. You know, yeah, I like to try to see and visualize and make things happen, but I don't quite have that, that eye at this point, you know, my eye hasn't evolved to that point yet where I can see as well as you can. So I'm more along the lines of like trying to, um, elicit something out of the subject and then catch it, you know? What, uh, what was the first photography book you bought after, uh, after we met i think the very first one i bought was uh a used copy copy of uh annie Leibovitz. um it was like her how to you know that there's that how to series of books with all the greats and all the masters and stuff uh might have been her and mary, mary Ellen mark did they do one together or something they did a book uh they did a book in the it's like 76, 77, they did a, was it that early? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty early for Annie's stuff. It was very early Annie work. And it was, it was actually a book on women in photojournalism. 
And Annie was considered a photojournalist at that time. She was doing like, she was going on tour, tour with the Rolling Stones or whatever with Ro- for Rolling Stone magazine. And she was basically a photojournalist at that point. And the, 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 the frightening thing about that book is how good Annie was at being a photojournalist. Her, her work yeah. in that book is so much better than Mary Ellen Marks. It's, it's unbelievable. And that's a, that's a, that's kind of a forgotten book at this time. Well, that's, you know, I had messaged you and I was like, Hey, you know, I want to get a book, you know, what, what do you recommend? You know, I, I, you had all these street photography books and stuff. And I was very, I was very turned off by street photography, what I would consider at the time, like ugly pictures, you know? And so, you knew I, I was into portraits and stuff. And so you're like, Annie was one of the few names that I knew. And so it's like, Hey, get this, get her early, early works. So I got that one and I got another one of hers. That's just a solo book of her, like her first career, first part of her career retrospective book. I think it's just Annie Leibovitz pictures, I think. Um, but, but that Mary Ellen Mark and uh, Annie Leibovitz book, the one thing that I learned as I learned more about Annie in those days was that she was pretty crazy on tour with the Rolling Stones. I mean, she was on tour with the Rolling Stones. She wasn't, she wasn't, she wasn't dancing on stage. I can guarantee you that. Uh, on the side of the stage, maybe. That's where I do my dancing, but not like front and center, obviously. But but uh, she was doing a lot more serious things uh, backstage with the band, you know, um, as far as drugs are concerned. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that was actually one of my first, in, like, in some ways, I mean, it's interesting that we brought this up in this sequence like this because that I kind of envisioned the way that I shoot in a lot of ways like Annie did at that time where it was sort of like get into the situation and then just shoot, you know? So it's like, but getting into that situation, I mean, she was, she had really gotten herself into the band almost. Well, the the reason I bring it up is because you knew Ansel Adams and Edward Weston before you were really, when you were just kind of starting out. And when I was just starting out, Photo books were rare, and basically the the only photo books you could find in a store, like a book bookstore, was was Ansel Adams and sometimes Edward Weston, and yeah. that was it. And if you wanted to look at photography books, you'd go to the library, and um, I would wherever I went, it could be a small town in Nebraska, you know, and I'd drive by their library and I'd stop just to see what they'd have in the way of the photography section. If we, if a, my parents went on vacation, if we went on vacation as a family, I would, you know, everybody's, you know, we're in Orlando at Disney world. I would go to the, make time to go to the library. It was always, it was always a search to find these images. And so to think, you know, 30 years later um, when everything you have every access to to this whole uh, history of photography online to a certain degree that you still kind of the first things you come across are Ansel Adams and Edward Weston uh, is interesting. It's just the printed image. That's where, you know, the printed image and other photographers is where is where I learned the most. I think that's kind of where everybody learns the most. And um, the printed image is kind of fallen by the wayside again, although we do have this kind of the golden age of the photo book, but um, the... Uh, the trend is not, you know, looking good as far as magazines go. The, the magazine photography is 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 going downhill quick. Um, the nice thing, the nice thing is, so when I was, you know, sixteen or seventeen and starting out, you couldn't go to Starbucks or the Barnes and Noble, and for the price of a Starbucks, you know, five, four or five bucks. 
you didn't have access to a whole magazine rack. You actually had to buy magazines. And so I'd go to the magazine rack and I'd stare at it for like an hour and think, you know, do I go with uh, French Vogue or Italian Vogue? And they're both going to be like eight or nine bucks, which was a lot of money. And do I get a copy of Perry Match or do I, you know, do I get that and Life magazine? And so what, what happened because of that is when you got a copy of, say you got a copy of Italian and French Vogue at the same time, you would uh, take it home and you'd, you'd pour through it and you'd study it and you'd get exhausted just by going through every single image in the magazines and comparing them and looking at the ads, looking at everything. And you do that until you're exhausted. And then you do it again the next day. And then maybe the next week and maybe a month from then, because you had such an, such an investment in just getting that paper. And so it really forced you as a photographer to, uh, to dig in deep to every image in, you know, opposed to today, we can, we're swiping across Instagram at less than, you know, half a second per image. And so, and, and, you know, the, the, the idea of having a printed page and holding it and being able to look closer and stuff, um, there's, a, there's a lot of knowledge to be gained there if, if you invest it and if you invest your time in just looking. The, the other thing we had to do is we had to go to uh, the microfish <laughs> in the library and so, so you'd, you'd, you'd sit down with a roll of microfish and you'd look through a year of Life magazine in, you know, a three-hour setting, things like that. And so not having that ready access to images online kind of forced you to act as a researcher in some regard, which I think... Yeah, it was because it was just this huge investment. I mean, it wasn't like going to college for eight years and walking away from a PhD, but there was still an investment. And I mean, you you had more invested in in the pictures that you did have access to seeing, you know. And so, whereas now, I mean, even I mean, even if I go to Barnes and Noble and sit down, I could take ten magazines off the rack and flip through them in like you know two minutes each be out of there in 15 minutes you know i mean that's that's how fast like we consume like that's not the same as buying one of them and spending a month with it and looking at them over and over again and like really thinking about the pictures deeply and really even committing them to memory in a lot of ways too i mean because just flipping through you you're not going to remember if you just barely glance at some pictures oh i like that i don't like that oh i like that i don't like that you're not you're not going to commit any of that to memory but I know that uh, I can relate to that, though, because uh, when I started do, getting really interested in fashion photography, I got a couple of uh, fashion magazines, subscriptions to some fashion magazines. And there's a couple of them that just come out twice a year. And so, I mean, you have that one issue for six months. You're not getting another one for six months, you know. And so those magazines, I noticed, I looked at them time and time again. I would bookmark pages, pictures that I liked, come back to them, look at them again, use them as references. And now I have this library of those book of those magazines that I can use for references that are all marked out, that are dog-eared pages that I remember. People will say something and I'll be like, oh, it's like that one shoot that's in this magazine. You know, I'll pull it out and show it to them. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Let's do that. You know, stuff, stuff like that. So, so it's possible in today's world, but I mean, how, I can't tell you how many photographers I met. They, they don't own a photography book. They don't own a magazine. They don't have a subscription to Italian Vogue. Um, they don't, you know, have a print hanging on their wall. None of that. So, so that's definitely something that I've learned from you. So I would say, you know, I've kind of bastardized some of your approach in some ways. Um, like going to the mag, you know, go to Barnes and Noble and flip through 20 magazines in 20 minutes. You know, like that's, that's sort of like the equivalent of scrolling through Instagram, but it, in print form, at least slightly better. Um, but actually buying magazines, buying books, reading them, looking at them over and over again, coming back to them time and time again, 
you know, that's when you're really taking it to the next level of studying it, you know, really studying it. Like you said, being a researcher, not just, it's not just a hobby. It's not just a pretty picture I like to look at. So I scroll through Instagram, you know, it's a study. The thing, the thing I always ask myself is, uh, I mean, there are two questions. You try to get into the photographer's head and figure out what they're thinking, what they're, what they were trying to accomplish, what they're trying to say. But then the questions I would ask myself after all that, I would say, if I was in that same situation, would I have done a better job or a worse job than this photographer? And if I was in that situation, how would I have approached it? So that's the two questions that I always would ask myself. But speaking of reference, speaking of Barnes and Noble, this is, this book is a great book. I just bought a new copy today just because I like to have several copies. It's called Photo Box, and it was printed in like 2010 or 2011, I think. I'm just looking for the, uh, the date is, uh, 2009. Okay, so it's 10 years old. This book's 10 years old now. It's published by Abrams. It's called Photo Box. It's kind of little, got a magnet in it, and it's got, uh, it's a little photo box. And the th cool thing about this book is that it is, uh, it's by categories, not photographers. And it's got every, every genre and every photographer who became famous in that genre and it has one sample of their work and Roberto Koch or he might pronounce it Koch is uh wrote uh, wrote a piece on every photographer and why they're important and it's a great book I'll just open up a random page so so this is Bettina Rhymes and it's just you know it's one shot of her and uh, what's her face, Mila. And then there's a little piece about why she's in, important as a photographer. So I picked this up. I was in Barnes and Noble and I picked it up. Uh, you know, whenever, 10 years ago when it first came out, and I'm like, oh, photo box. Oh, compliment. You know, everybody's going to be in here. And I started looking through it. And there's no index of photographers, and I'm like starting to get pissed because I can't find myself. And yeah. <laughs> I'm looking through it, I go through it, and I'm and at that point, I'm just totally pissed when I get through the end of it and I'm not in the book. And it's a Saturday, I'm in Barnes and Noble, the kids are running around doing their thing. And I pull out my laptop and I start like doing my search, right? And I literally, I pull out my cell phone. I call up, I call up the switchboard at Abrams and I, and I leave a message on the, on the, on the, uh, the editor of the book. I leave a message on their voicemail. And then I like find the, uh, the writer's email and I send him a nasty email. I'm so pissed. And I'm just like, at this point in my career, if I'm not in this book, I'm not going to just like stand idly by. I'm going to like, I'm like, like at least, you know, say something. Right. And so I, I left probably three or four voicemails at Abrams. I sent this guy an email and I probably sent a, I probably sent my agent an email. I, I was pissed. And so, uh, I finished all this. And I put the book down and my daughter, Yasmin, walks over and she's like, Dad, why is your name on the back of this book? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> You're on the back cover. So, so like they have all the photographers, they have a lot of photographers' names on the back of the book. And so, you know, m my name is in there. And so then I have to like go through page by page and like, and then I read what this guy wrote about me and it's so just lovely and i just sent him a nasty email like five minutes before oh my god that's hilarious so did he so take you I out of the newer to, version I, I, well i i 
I had to, I sent him an email. I wrote, I wrote a public policy uh, apology on my blog at the time. Like what a jerk I was, but you know, I guess. That's funny because it's so not like you to send emails like that and stuff. You're usually pretty measured. Usually I'm a little more hot headed than you are. And, uh, well, at this point, at this point, I don't care. I just don't care. But 10 years ago, you know, we're just making, we're kind of like in that first, I had, sh I, I, okay. So I had, hadn't gone fully digital till the 2008, I think. And the magazines are all going out of business and everybody's scrambling for their their place in the world and so at that point i was like just kind of you know hostile in general about the whole business and everything but anyways yeah. I, I like i said i bought another copy of this book today just to have it because it's so good and they're pretty cheap they're on you know amazon and it's a it's one of those books it's a quick introduction so here's anton uh, Corb, Corbjin, Corbine, Richard Avedon, Eve Arnold, Stuart Franklin, just the 30th anniversary of Tiananmen Square, you know, a couple days ago. So I know exactly where Stuart was standing when he made this picture. Everybody had rooms in this hotel. At, at one point, we were scattered around the city, you know, before... Uh, before things really started to get serious because I went there personally, I went there just to, uh, photograph this, uh, Soviet, uh, Chinese summit with Gorbachev. Cause I was photographing Gorbachev a lot at that time. And so the student demonstrations was kind of a, just a side note to the, to the summit. It was an important summit. These guys hadn't really talked in probably 40 years. China and Russia, they shared a border. They're both communist nations and they, they were, uh, they were not talking to each other. So it was a big deal, this summit. And so then the student demonstrations happened at the same time. And it just, uh, it just, uh, took over and it, that's kind of, I mean, it really embarrassed the Chinese government, but, uh, I, so I went there to, uh, photograph Gorbachev the students came later it would turn into a big deal I got the cheapest ticket um to to shoot this you know I wanted to go there so I think uh I think Life Magazine gave me a thousand dollars and Time Magazine maybe Time Magazine gave me a thousand dollars and Life Magazine gave me a bag of film and so literally they had a they had a, a locker Time, Life, Sports Illustrated, everybody shared the locker. And Mel Levine ran the locker, and you'd go up and you'd say, Mel, I need some film. And he'd just, he'd take out a big shopping bag and fill it with film for you. So I had a bag full of film. I had $1,000. And there's nothing, you know, you call up, you call up the 800 number for Delta, or it was Northwest at that point, to get a ticket because they were kind of the ones that flew in that direction. And I got a ticket for $256 from New York to Beijing. So I still had like 700 bucks after everything's said and done. Um, but I didn't really check the ticket. And so the ticket left from LaGuardia, which is a bad sign if you're flying internationally. Went from LaGuardia to Memphis to Los Angeles to Narita, Tokyo, Narita, then to Seoul, Korea, back to Hong Kong, and finally Air China to Beijing. It was a long, it was, it was, uh, it was a cheap ticket, but it was a long ticket. <laughs> we actually got, got into late into Seoul and had to spend the night there. Um, and then by that, so that was like two days. So the only good part about that trip is was before com computers had, had uh, streamlined the seating process. 
So there's always like four or five seats that were free so everybody could sleep, you know, on the on the long flights. But by the time I got to Beijing, the student protest had taken over the whole the the whole news news story. So that was thirty years that was thirty years ago. No, I got off the I got off the plane and went directly to the square and just, you know, stayed there for a long time. I was there for about a month. Yeah, you want to go fully into that story? Since it's the 30th. Well, so so the you know, it was uh time I was I was I wasn't under contract with time or uh, life at that point, but I was, um, I was kind of a minus list at that point. I was still really young. Um, and, but I was, I was, I was, I was on the list that if I had a good idea or if I wanted to do something, they'd throw a little bit of money or film my way. And so, uh, when I got to, when I got to Beijing, uh, Robin Moyer, the the the, uh, the Asian area photographer. I'd known Robin because of my first, my second big job for time was the Seoul Olympics, and so that was '88, and so this is in '89. So less than a year later, I'm I'm back with Robin in Beijing, and Robin knows everybody in town. You know, he immediate, immediately took me and introduced me to uh, Susan Zarinsky who's now, I think she's the head of CBS or whatever. Um, she was, she was the, she was the, the producer, the TV producer at the time. So she had the whole city wired at that point. Um, we had a couple other time magazine photographers in town, but time magazine also had a bureau. So it was the only thing. Yeah. The only thing I had to do was shoot film and drop it off at the bureau. I didn't have to worry about getting film on an airplane or anything like that. We had uh, we had a system in place to get that done. So, you know, I was there a month and every day more photographers would show up because it it, it wasn't just about the summit anymore. It was about the students. And everybody kind of knew each other and every morning we'd we'd meet at that hotel where that that image of Tank Man was made. Three different guys made that picture. And yeah. each version has its own kind of uh, unique kind of sweetness to it. It's a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an image that will out, outlive all of us. Um, the, uh, but everybody kind of met at that hotel every morning because they had a good place for breakfast and it was cheap. So, and it was cat. It was a it was a little cafe, and it had a uh, a bar. A, it was like a, an American diner almost layout. So everybody'd sit around the bar, and you know, eat breakfast and pass around magazines because everybody that came into town would have the latest magazines from Hong Kong, you know, or wherever they flew in from. So that's how you would see how you were doing at that point. You're uh, because everybody was with an agency, so well, you, you know, you'd kind of hear, but you wouldn't really know. And so, somebody come in and they'd have the latest copy of Time magazine, and you'd immediately compare that to the guy sitting next to you who was working for Newsweek, and you'd say, Oh, I got this, and they got that, and you'd naturally think your pictures were so much better and used so much better, and but then you'd get the You'd get the European publications, so somebody come in with Perry Match or Le Figaro or, you know, whoever, um, Stern, Der Spiegel. You know, there were dozens and dozens of magazines. And so it was just kind of uh, your, de your debriefing and your, uh, your intelligent gathering happened at breakfast every morning with uh, sharing information and figuring out what your day looked like. That's pretty interesting that almost everyone was in the same basic area trying to basically make similar pictures, but different pictures. 
Yeah, and it was it was it was a competition, but nobody was. Uh, it was never. It was never. There was. N it wasn't about trying to make the the best picture of. It wasn't like working in Washington D.C., where there was like one pit. There's one picture or two pictures that come out of a a Senate hearing, or a State of the Union address, or the Rose Garden of that day, and. In Washington D.C., it's all about that moment when, when this one, you know, points his finger at that one or something like this. This was, you know, Tiananmen Square is 640 acres. It's a square mile, um, yeah. and there's a million people there. So <laughs> there's plenty for everybody, and at, at some point, the whole city is uh, is is uh in on the on the show you know streets are blocked off the demonstration is moving around the city there's marches there's uh there's soldiers moving around there's there's demonstrations outside of the the official state housing for political leaders things like that so there's plenty there's no you know it's it's just about making making a lasting image at that point it's not about trying to make something that uh is going to beat the guy you're standing next to um so you know everybody everybody eventually stayed at that hotel because it was the cheapest hotel and um we were all except for the wire guys and a couple magazine guys who were actually on contract Everybody is an agency photographer there, and so with agency photographers, your what you what you what you make depends a lot on how much you spend. So to get a cheap hotel, share a room with two or three other people, um, eat at the cheapest ch cheapest place, whatever, that all uh, reflected your bottom line. So everybody kind of ended up staying there. It was it was like that in almost in everywhere you went. I mean, a lot of the photographers would, and other journalists would be kind of posted up in the same hotels, same restaurants, like Olympics or other world events and stuff that you were at. So you kind of got to know all those people. I mean, you were work. You would have breakfast with them and then go out and do your thing. Come back, have a yeah. Drink everybody, with them. everybody knew everybody knew everybody else, and you know you'd see that that person in Beijing, and then a month later later you'd see him you know, uh, in Haiti or something or Northern Ireland or Soviet Union, yeah. wherever. Um, yeah, you, so you had this, you had this base of people who you knew and who you could trust, or at least, you know, you knew, you, you, you knew them more than just, you know, by their byline. Um, yeah. So yeah, and there were there was camaraderie. There's competition, um, but it wasn't cutthroat competition for the most part. Absolutely, it was it was always there was always uh, there was always a place. You know, even like so, like in uh, when we'd spend the night in in the square when we thought you know the when we finally thought the, the military was going to come in, you'd, you'd spend the night in the square and the square was pretty filthy at that point. You know, there's no, there's no, uh, garbage disposal. There's no, there's no maintenance happening. And so, and it was, it was kind of rough too, cause you, you had, you know, rough characters who were just trying to cause trouble or, uh, instigators, government instigators, you know, there was a lot of, so, we would sleep uh, in the CBS. CBS actually uh, cordoned off a little tiny piece of the square, and they brought a flathead, a flatbed trailer into there where they do their their live broadcasts from. And so we would kind of sleep in that area. You're still kind of on the ground. You didn't. You couldn't lay down. It was too dirty. But you could, you could uh, lay against a the post. To, or of the fence that goes around it or something. Um, yeah. We were sleeping in there one night and my buddy, 
Oh, one of the Turnleys. There was there were there were a couple limos sitting there, and uh, I think it was Peter. And Peter said, uh, "I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go sleep in that that limo." I'm like, "Okay, I don't don't get us kicked out of here." And he opened up, and and uh, he woke up Dan Rather, and Dan Rather thought he had to go on the air immediately. He's like, he woke up out of a deep sleep. He's like, "What? What's happening?" Do I have to go on the air? And David was like, oh, sorry. So let me crawl in there with you, Dan. <laughs> so what ended up happening with that, the Tiananmen Square shoot for you? What did you end up shooting in that? And uh, how did that all work out? I made a couple pictures. Uh, I was sitting, I was sitting pretty well as far as, uh, as far as uh, I had a I had a balcony room in the hotel, I had a 604 with me. I travel with a 604 when I was doing Gorbachev, just because uh, you never knew how far you'd be away, and so that was just an advantage to have a 604. And most of those tank man images, I think the longest one was made with a 400, but. Uh, so what people don't realize about Tiananmen Square is that uh, the demonstrations had been called off over a week before the actual massacre took place. And what happened is the local students went back to their local universities and the guys, the kids that were trapped there uh, were from from out of out of uh, state or out of the, out of town at least and yeah. they couldn't afford to get on the train they didn't have train fare to get back home so they were literally stuck there the official demonstration had been called off and the the people left were stuck there they couldn't leave because they 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 ran out of money and they were just college students you know like all of them and so you went from like a million people to say a hundred or 200,000 people, which 200,000 people is still a lot. But when you're used to a completely packed square with a million people and you have these avenues around each side of the square that are hundred yard wide, almost avenues they are huge. Um, and that's all filled with people. That's down to like one lane of traffic. You have these people spilled out all across the area. Um, the hundred or two hundred thousand, however, however many were left, were just this small little section of the square. And at that point, people started leaving. Journalists started leaving because nobody in their right mind you know, when you're thinking it through, now you're down to this small group of people. If, if you just like made the train fare free for the weekend, everybody would go back to their respective provinces, provinces. Um, yeah. It was a very easy solution at that time. But we didn't factor in exactly how embarrassed the, the government leaders in China I mean, they couldn't even get in and out of their own, you know, posh, uh, posh uh, compounds where they were all living because they were blocked off with students and and uh, their own police. You know, uh, everybody was blocking them off. So yeah. we didn't we didn't realize that we we knew we kind of had it. You know, the 18th, uh, I guess it's a division of the People's Liberation Army. They're, they're the guys based in Beijing, they had supported the demonstrations, at least to a certain point. So they weren't, nobody was really worried about them at that point. Um, what they didn't realize, we didn't realize is that, uh, you know, they're, they're going to bring a division in from Mongolia to do the dirty work. And so bringing a division of soldiers, Mongolian soldiers, into Beijing would be the equivalent of 
you know, bringing, bringing soldiers from wherever, El Salvador into Washington, D.C. There, they, there's no, there's hardly a common language there, let alone a, a, an ethnic group or anything like that. It's a different country. Just yeah. Mongolia, China, two different places. Um, and so those are the soldiers that actually did the, the, the shooting, the massacre. Um, so basically everybody left. And so the other thing people don't realize is the Chinese military had installed a new phone system in China and state of the art, which they didn't have. And so at the same time they're installing that, they uh, they had the option for no additional charge to just make that phone system work on an inter- international level. So the phone lines from Beijing to New York were were cheap and good. I mean, it was just like calling from New York to New Jersey. That, that's how clear the the phone lines were. And so uh, this 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 woman that I liked, I called her up and I asked her. Um, for a date on June 4th in New York City. And so, uh, you know, because of the international date line or whatever, I left on June 3rd after everything had died down, or the dem- demonstrations, everything had pretty much died down. Um, I left and uh, went to this date in New York. So I was set up in the hotel. I had the lens. I was in the right place, and I left the day before to get back. It was it was a you know basically I left on June second New York time to get back on June third and go to my date on June fourth, and um, didn't tell. I was working for probably a. I I, I was on I was I was on on assignment for both time and life at that point. And my agent had made probably deals. He's, he made deals with at least one magazine in every country in Europe. And so when the massacre happened, they all thought I was still in Beijing. And so they weren't really happy with me when they realized that I was already in, back in New York. And a lot of guys did that. A lot of guys left early. So what happened on the date? How'd that work out? It worked out pretty well because we got married and we had four children and we're together today living in Montana. So it, it was, <laughs> it was, it was worth it. It was worth it, right? Worth it. Worth missing a great picture to have an actual life. Yeah. And you know, I, I was my editor at life magazine. I don't think the editors at time magazine were really happy. I don't know if we ever actually had that conversation at time. I know my agents at Contact Press Images were Bob Pledge was really unhappy, um, but uh, my editor at Life Magazine was Bobby Baker Burroughs, whose uh, whose uh, father-in-law was Larry Burroughs. He was, you know, we lost him in Vietnam, and she was just so happy that I was back, and she could have cared less. So. That's, you know, that's the important things. You know, those those are the the relationships you have uh, with with your editors, the the great ones. Um, the least thing they're really worried about, they're they're they put, or at that time they put people in position that they wanted, uh, they wanted to see what they saw, so that. It was about looking, and they wanted people that uh, they knew would would work hard, and they knew they would work smart. And so, if you had a if you had a, a photographer that uh, that did those two things, and then had enough of a thought process in their head to make interesting pictures with that hard work, um, that th- those were the people that that the magazines uh, 
really wanted to work with, the good editors wanted to work with. Yeah, that's awesome. And then, I mean, like you said, that's that was basically like the first date with your soon-to-be wife after that. Yeah, that was our first date. And so that was uh, about two and a half years later we got married. Oh, that's awesome, man. No, yeah, it's definitely was worth it. I've met your wife. She's definitely way worth it. <laughs> if anything, she's probably the one wishing that you had stayed over there and missed the date. <laughs> she could have got out of all this. So anyway, but uh, that's a great story, though. Um, just like all the little bits about, you know, leading up to it and then, you know, being willing to just walk away from it as well. You know, sometimes, and it wasn't just that you knew, you didn't know what was about to happen. So, I mean, you were making a calculated decision that, hey, this thing's pretty much dying down. You know, it wasn't like you knew in advance that you were walking away from, you know, a very famous historical moment. Well, I mean, the smart, the smart thing would have been just to, since I was, I was, I was getting paid directly not just from time and life but from probably a dozen different magazines i could have just i could have hung out there and milked that thinking nothing was going to happen just stayed there for another week or 10 days and i would have uh you know made a lot of money but for me you know honestly the and th this was like a month i was there a month i didn't know you know, nobody knew what was going to happen. On hindsight, it's kind of, you know, more more obvious. But anything over thirty days, I would I would get bored. I couldn't I couldn't shoot anything for I I couldn't stay on one subject matter for more than thirty days. So it worked out. So you were ready to be out of there. Yeah. The That's why money, you made the day. Money was never an issue. Never really mattered. I could care less. No, but I mean, that is interesting that you were, you know, sort of sitting right there on the front steps of history, you know, and uh, made a more of a personal decision to leave as opposed to a career oriented one. Yeah. And that was kind of, you know, when I, when I, when I got in, in, into photojournalism, that was always the goal. It was just like, oh, I get to, I get a front row seat to history, and um, and that's, I could have been a fashion, I could have, I, I could have been any type of photographer, but just that, that added, um, that added appeal of getting front row seats to these these historic events. And I also kind of thought I didn't really know how photography worked at the time, or how the business worked. I thought I could do something like like uh student protests in China and then two months later do something for, you know, Vogue or something like that. And that's not really that's not really how it works. Yeah. So you can't just transfer from one magazine genre to another. No, you get I mean, even inside the magazine you would you would get trapped into being the portrait photographer the political photographer the sports photographer the hard news photographer who was you know the fireman who was always ready to jump on a plane and go to go to wherever the fire you know burst out of so you had all those little sub genres inside of photojournalism the conflict photographer conflict photographer you know they i and I, 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 I was different in that regard that I, I did all those things. The only thing I really didn't do was the assigned portrait because I wasn't very good at that. And I'd do it now and then, and it would always, you know, turn out bad. But, uh, you know, when they needed somebody and they didn't have any real portrait photographer, I'd do that too. Yeah. You jack of all trades. Uh, that's kind of, I had a question for you about something along those lines. Uh, what is a PFJ? A PFJ? Yeah. Yeah. 
that's a that's an abbreviation for um, a photo fucking journalist. So, Did I mean, not know that? what does it entail to to be a PFJ? I mean, you kind of hit on it. I mean, well, I, I I came I came up with that phrase. Well, first of all, it's like you know, um, it's from Apocalypse Now, right? And a lot of Apocalypse Now uh, is incorporated into this business. You know, when, uh, when, uh, geez, what's his name? He's a good photographer, too. The guy who's playing a photojournalist in Apocalypse Now, and he's completely stoned out of his head, and he's been with Colonel Kurtz up the river for who knows how long. And he's like, I'm a photo fucking journalist, man. And uh, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of just a something that you, you know, everybody kind of remembers. If you're a photographer, you remember that in that film. That was a that was a cool moment. But uh, the other thing, the apocalypse nowness of the business, is this idea that. If you're, if, okay, so that it comes out of Hurricane Katrina. And we're in a boat. So I guess there's that, there's that apocalypse now analogy too. We're in a boat and we're driving around uh, New Orleans. And it's kind of, it's, it's not a dangerous situation. But it's kind of sketchy. I mean, we're in a we're in a liberated boat with volunteers. We're all kind of just driving around, looking, you know, to make pictures, looking to help people, you know, whatever whatever the situation uh, required. And so we uh, there's no boat ramps in a flood. You know the boat ramps are already flooded. So when you're when you're when you're putting a boat in the water from a trailer, it's kind of a tricky situation because you got to back your vehicle up into the water, and so yeah. and the vehicle you know can stall out whatever. You got to get in there pretty deep deep to float the vehicle off the trailer. So anyways, we're going back. We we've got this. Uh, we got another liber. We've got a deuce and a half, which was also I don't. I'm not quite sure where that came from, but that's a big army vehicle, two and a half ton truck, which can drive through, you know, deep water, fairly deep water, maybe four feet deep water. And so this new uh, F-250 pulls up, crew cab, uh, King Ranch, you know, like a very expensive high-end truck. And it's got a new boat on a trailer on the back. And these guys, and there's there's literally there's a, there's a, it's in transit sticker on the truck. It's from Houston, and so these people bought a truck, they bought a boat, and they drove in from Houston to come to New Orleans, and they're backing up their boat, and everybody gets into the back of the boat, so this boat is now filled with people. And it's, you know, your typical flat bottom bass type of boat. And so now the boat is filled with people. It's even heavier. And they can't get the truck, the F-250, deep enough into the water to float the boat off of it. And so uh, so I, I noticed one of these, one of these, uh, it's a weird crew and one of the people in the crew is this Hollywood actor and they uh the reason they got in the back of the boat is they didn't want to get wet they didn't want to touch the water because you know all the you know it was like typhoid in the water and this and that hepatitis c it was like if you touch the water you're gonna die well all the volunteers all the all the photojournalists 
you know, we'd been soaking wet for three or four days at that point. I mean, you know, it's just like, and so I said, you know, don't get on the plane if you're not going to get off the boat, which is a riff on apocalypse. Now it's like, never get off the boat. Okay. So if you're a photojournalist, you have the choice. You're a journalist. You always have that choice to, to say, no, you don't have to go into the dangerous area. You don't have to go into the conflict zone. You can always say no, but if you, if you take the money, if you get on the plane to fly to Iraq, you've kind of said yes at that point to going into the conflict zone. And the same with a flood in New Orleans. So don't get on the plane if you're not going to get off the boat. Because what you've done is you've taken that job away from somebody who will get off, off the boat. And you've used up the resources of your magazine. You put your editor who trusted you to make pictures in a terrible situation um, if you're not going to deliver or not, not even deliver if you're not going to try to deliver. You have to be there 100%. You know, Larry Burroughs, we mentioned Larry Burroughs a few minutes ago. You're there 100%. It doesn't mean that you can't leave on a helicopter after you make your pictures. You know, Larry Burroughs, you know, his helicopter went down. So that, maybe that's not a great example, but um, you got you to be there 100%. If you're not there 100%, you're just in the way. You're just a, you're just a, 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 a tragedy tourist taking up room that could be better served by someone who's willing to get off the boat and help a person. And so the funny part, the funny part of the whole story is so I back up, I'm in the back of the deuce and a half and I'm kind of guiding the guy driving. And so I say, let's back up and help him pull this boat off this trailer. And so I throw him a, a line from the back of the truck. I said, hook that to your boat and we'll pull you off your trailer. And so there's another guy on the boat who was like a Hollywood producer type who would repeat everything I said. He wouldn't acknowledge that I said it or that we were actually helping them, but he would repeat what I said as if it was his idea, which is, you know, kind of how things work in Hollywood. Just, you know, yeah. par for the course. And so I would say, tie that to this. I, and, I'd, and I said, you know, that's a brand new boat. Did you check? Is there oil in the engine? If not, there's going to be a can of oil on the boat somewhere. You need to, he's like, check the oil. Okay. There's oil in the engine. We're good to go. And so <laughs> I'm going through their checklist. I'm helping them out. I'm pulling them off the boat. I'm like, okay, unhook from the trailer. We're going to pull you off now. And he's like, unhook from the trailer. We're going to pull, uh, pull us off now. Yeah. And the one thing I didn't think of saying was check to see if the plug in the bottom of the boat is in, you know, because, you know, boats have plugs to drain. When you get out of the water, you drain the bottom of the boat with the plug. And so nobody checked yeah. the plug. And so we pull them off the trailer. They're in the swamp water. They're in the hurricane, typhoid, hepatitis C water, and their boat immediately starts filling up with water because the plug isn't in and there. And, and so the Hollywood actor who's wearing a bulletproof vest, by the way, a bullet, a, a level three bulletproof vest, which, um, wouldn't really stop anything that anybody would be using there. It'd like stop a BB gun maybe. So he's wearing like this white thin bullet resistant vest over his t-shirt and he's got new boot, boots on to go with a new boat. And he's, he's like trying to keep his feet out of the water <laughs> as the boat is sinking and it's getting smaller and smaller. And so the, the, to, the long story to answer your question, a photo fucking journalist gets off the boat. He gets on the plane, he gets off the boat and he, uh, he or she, goes there a hundred percent because you can't go there 90% and hope to make a picture. And if you go there at 
You're just in the way. And so the photo fucking journalist, where that came out, was we had just come out of Iraq. And at that point, Iraq was a no-fly zone. So it's a 12-hour drive from, from, uh, from uh, Baghdad to uh, Jordan, Amman, Jordan. It's about a 12-hour drive. And you had these, these guys, that was their whole business, would drive back and forth. And you'd have these little convoys of two uh, suburbans with dual fuel lines because the fuel in Iraq was the fuel, the, the octane level was still pretty good, but the filtering process wasn't good. So you'd have to, you'd have to have dual fuel lines in your, in your vehicles just to keep running because eventually one of them would get clogged and you didn't want to get, you didn't want to get clogged in the, you know, in the middle of nowhere in Iraq with the fuel line. So, but anyways, we'd just come out of Iraq and this writer from uh, Washington uh, and, and a, there was like six of us. There were, there were, it was me, it was David Buto, another great photographer. We, we were both with U.S. News. We had two writers with us. We had uh, Karen Ballard was a photographer from a newspaper. And she had a writer with her too. And so we get, we get in this rental car. We're going to go to uh, Petra. We just got out of Iraq after a month in Iraq the day before. And we get in the rental car and I'm like, okay, I'll drive. And we we're in the hotel in the, in the parking lot of the hotel. And she goes, everybody's in the car. And she's like, can you drive a stick? And I'm like, I'm a photo fucking journalist. Of course I can drive a stick. <laughs> and so that's when, that became like uh, a thing for photographer, photojournalists to say. Yeah. Not just, you know, beyond the apocalypse now. But I mean, it kind of ref- it kind of refers to photojournalists being sort of uh, having a set of skills beyond just camera skills. You know. Yeah, you got to be the you got to be the race Bannons. You got to be, you know, from Johnny Quest. Race Bannon was the guy who. You know, he could drive or fly anything, but he could ride a horse. He could, he could, he knew judo. He, uh, yeah. he could drive a hovercraft for some odd reason. You know, he could do anything you needed him to do. Um, a buddy of mine, it was so funny. This is somewhere in Africa and I wasn't there at the time, but, uh, he was, uh, Agent France press, a, a, AFP photographer. And, the power was out. He had to transmit. This is in the film days. So he souped his film in the bathroom. Everybody would travel with a, a little dark room. So he souped his film in the bathroom, and he had his film, but there's no power in the, uh, in the hotel. And he had to get this picture out. And you've got this, you've got basically a very primitive film scanner is how you transmit. So you'd put your negative on the scanner it would it would spin and you or you might have had a print one where you had to actually make a print but this is probably just a negative because he didn't make a print because he would have needed electricity for that so anyways he has his negative it's ready to go but he has no electricity and he's got a sat phone and he noticed that for some reason the street lights are on in the street, although the whole city is without power, the street lights, for whatever reason, are still on. So he goes out in the street with his film scanner and plugs in to hot wires his street scan his his film scanner into the street light to transmit his picture. And that's just what these these PFJs that's their skill set to get things done, whatever you know. And and maybe maybe not any of us can go from whatever two twenty to two two forty to one twenty on hot wires and all that kind of stuff, but somebody in the group will know how to do that. Yeah. So it kind of just speaks to like having a just a really wide ranging skill sets, not just oh I'm a good photographer. I mean that gets you you know the, the ability to shoot like 
local news or something. But in order to really be a PFJ and go anywhere and do anything, I mean, you got to schmooze your way into situations. You told me a lot of stories about where you'd pick up a bottle of some kind of scotch or something in a duty-free airport because you know that, you know, a week later in Belarus or someplace you'd be, you could bribe someone with that to get in somewhere or get a room or, you know. So there's a lot more to the PFJ than just uh, how to make a picture. I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call it a bribe if it's like, a, if it's, if it's a commodity, you know, I mean, there was a time where you couldn't get a, you couldn't get a taxi in the Soviet Union without a pack of Marlboros. Money didn't work. Marlboros, you could, you hold up a, a pack of Marlboros, the guy would stop. Um, and I, I, I don't even consider that a bribe. A bribe is when you literally have to put cash in your passport when you hand it to somebody. And that happens too. But, you know, giving somebody a bottle of scotch, that's just like, that's just like being friendly. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, so, I mean, that's, that gets to the kind of the concept though, PFJ. I mean, basically you do anything to get, make the picture happen and get it, the picture back given, out. Given, given somebody a bottle of scotch in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That, that'll go far. Okay. Exactly. But not in Ireland. But not in Ireland. In Ireland. <laughs> You need a case of scotch. <laughs> no, I, Ireland. I mean, Ire, Ireland's a completely different ball game. I, 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 Ireland people do things because they they like you, and that just might mean having a beer with somebody that they might have actually paid for the beer. You know, having a pint and Ireland, Irish. You know, you just you get along by people liking you. Um, I guess that's. The, it's pretty much the same everywhere, but at some point, um, in some places, it does come down to that bottle of scotch. Not in Ireland, though. Gotcha. Ireland, gotcha. they could care less. If they yeah. like you, they'll do anything for you. If they don't, there's no 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 bottle of scotch is going to make it right. <laughs> exactly. But that's the difference. I mean, PFJ knows that. You know, you know what's going to work where and uh how to get in and, and get the pictures and get the pictures out and get yourself out you know yeah it's a street there's a street smartness there i mean it's uh it's a life kind of the kind of people that were were uh you know kind of uh i don't know a little delinquent when they were juvenile probably fit into this mold a little better and that's men or women the women are the women are just just as uh i mean margaret burke white was no you know she she was she was she she had a rough side to her too you know all of all the great ones well i mean just think about these what you're describing as a PFJ, I mean, compared to, I mean, there, you told the story in Katrina of, you know, it's a Hollywood actor that doesn't want to get his feet wet. But today, I mean, there's journalists that are like that, you know, I mean, there are people who um, use their own money, fly across the world to different locations and show up and they want to make pictures, but they don't want to get their feet dirty. You know, they don't want to get, they don't want to get their uh, elbows dirty you know they because don't want to get they, in the water they, they don't well they don't they've never nobody's ever nobody's ever given them that that uh example i think i don't think it's they they long to make those pictures but they might not know what those pictures look like they might not know how those pictures are made they might not know the people who made them one of my first i was pretty green around the gills and I was I was in Haiti, I, and this writer, Lucia. Lucia was about five foot tall. She worked for a Italian newspaper, the Italian communist newspaper. She probably spoke five or six languages, sharp as a wit. I think she was their Washington correspondent, actually. But we were in Haiti, and I knew her, 
from, you know, mutual friends. And she was, she's, she's a real fire firecracker. And I think she just kind of took me around as like, uh, to drive and kind of, well, no, I don't think she actually let me drive, but, uh, she just kind of kept me around, you know, just, she probably didn't want to travel by herself, you know, in certain areas, whatever. But, uh, she's, uh, we were, we were in one of the slums and she's like, well, why don't you spend the night here? And I'm like, I don't even go out after dark here. I'm, you know, I, I was just, you know, young and scared and naive and didn't even know really what I was doing. She's like, Jim would, meaning Jim Nakwe. She said if he wanted if he wanted to shoot shoot pictures here, he'd spend the night here. He'd he'd go and live with that family right there for three or four days. I'm like, geez, I don't know if I want to do that. Um, and then I don't think it was that trip. I think it was a different. This is probably, this might have been, it might have been the same trip, who knows. But uh, then I was with Jim, Jim Nakwe, and uh, and something had happened. And the way things work, you know, it's all rumors. There's not, there weren't cell phones, there weren't uh, radio, you know, there weren't whatever. But there was a rumor that something had happened somewhere. And so we get in his car. And he's whipping around the city. We've got a we've got a, a translator with us, and and I'm watching Jim, and it's a little frightening because this intensity on his face. And Jim always has like he's always good looking, good looking hair, or whatever. And at one point, this strand of hair came down across his face, and he's driving and he's shifting gears, and he's just like, Whoosh. I'm just like, geez, that that's there's Race Bannon right there, right. Race never got his hair messed up. He could be judo chopping people. He'd never get his hair messed. So we show up at this event, and it's a rally for the mayoral candidate of Port-au-Prince who's backed by the Tantan Makou, which was the the muscle of uh, Baby Doc's muscle, Papa Doc's muscle. Um, they were like, they were like the bad guys. They were really bad. And, um, so it's a, it's a, a political rally filled with Tauntaun Makut and their supporters and their political <laughs> leader for their candidate for mayor. And it's in the middle of a, a, a very bad area. And so at that point, I had been doing a lot of politics in Washington, D.C., and so I just naturally gravitated. I mean, I walked through the crowd, and I, it, was, it was like Laurel and Hardy goes, goes, to the, goes to the photo shoot. I stepped on somebody's toe, and I turned around to apologize, and I stepped on somebody else's toe behind me, and it was just like... I was fumbling around. I was just like so out of my element. And so I made my way to the, to the, to the platform where the, uh, where the political candidate was speaking. And it was probably like a 12 by 12 foot platform on a little bit, eight feet, say above the crowd, not that high, had these huge speakers and the candidate hadn't spoken yet. And I just kind of made my way through security and got on the platform. I thought, okay, I can see what's going on up here and I can get my bearings because I was completely out of sorts and I knew that. And, um, but they had these huge speakers on the platform. So the music was blasting in my ear. So I couldn't hear anything. I could just see. And as I'm watching the crowd, I'm trying to make some pictures the crowd just erupts like full scale panic. And, you know, there's probably like seven or 800 people. There was a big crowd for the middle of a, a, a slum basically. And people were like, there was a stampede. It was like, it was like a nightmare scene. 
and it was it was after dark at this point so it was like it was like twilight you just had enough light to see that things were like ugly panic people i mean you didn't know what was happening but the music kept playing so i couldn't like f- even figure out what was happening so i get off the stage and i get down into the crowd and i'm trying to make pictures but it's too dark and you know now you're in full shade you know with the light setting and there's just like the sky is illuminated that's it and people are falling and you can see like compound fractures and they're getting stamped it's really an ugly ugly scene and then everybody stops and just starts laughing and at this point you're just like what what part of the looking glass have i fallen through because you can't it doesn't you can't your mind can't comprehend what's happening and so i'm trying to figure out what happened and i find somebody and they're like oh it was just some motor a motorcycle backfired started the whole stampede and you know they're probably i don't i don't know if there are people killed but there are people messed up really bad i mean i saw bones sticking out of skin so um i find jim and it starts raining at that point and so we get back to the hotel and as we're driving i said jim what did you do in that situation i couldn't figure out what was happening he said i ran towards where i thought the explosion had come from and i'm th- yeah. and i'm sitting there thinking that's just that's insane you ran towards the explosion and and you know i'm i'm still really young i don't really like i said i didn't know what i was doing and yeah. um and so that was something that I, I really had to think about the point is i had to see how it was done not only see but feel and smell and hear how it was done before i understood what went into that process and then exactly. and then so 30 minutes later you know we're having we're eating dinner and all the photo- and now it's like nine o'clock at night so you know you're in the hotel for the evening at that point and we're eating dinner and it's a bunch of photographers and this french agency photographer comes up to me and i kind of knew him i still know him and it's raining outside he's completely covered in rain and he's like ken there's a there's a Tantan Makut rally happening right now in this neighborhood and you have to come with me. I'm like, I just came from there. It's over. It's over. That's how the, you know, the, the, the rumor had just gotten to him, you know, but I'm like, yeah. it's, it's, it's a typhoon out there. <laughs> One, it's a typhoon Two, It's dark. Just sit down. I know you're French. I know you're an agency photographer, but just have a, have a chicken, you know, <laughs> just relax. So, I mean, having the, that set of skills and like being in those kind of situations, I mean, it pretty much makes any kind of photography that you're doing in Montana or in the U.S. just like a cakewalk in comparison. I mean, how does it, how does it color, how does like those kind of experiences color like, you know, when you have like a commercial shoot in Billings, Montana? So this is the thing, the thing about doing this type of work, and we laugh about this, is that, uh, you know, we put everything, we we were, we, uh, we had magazines backing us and we had agencies and all this stuff, but we never really had money. We would spend everything we had for whatever reason. It just we weren't one of our skill sets this group as a whole and i can speak for the whole group the agency photographer group money management was not one of those skills that was common and so but we'd laugh about it the the the, it was very and the, the joke was it was very hard to worry about your american express bill when you're in a conflict zone it didn't matter nothing and the only thing that mattered was going out, making pictures, getting your film back to New York or Paris. And anything beyond that was gravy. 
you know, anything beyond that was just like a luxury. We were completely focused on making those pictures and then getting that film to the magazines through our agencies. So when you, when you, when you, when you, when you flash forward, you know, um, to the real world and the child, like, you know, whatever, um, tracks muddy shoes across the carpet you're just like well i'm not gonna i'm not that that's not even on my scale of things to freak out about in this at this point in life you know because yeah everything at this point everything at this point is just a blessing and i think that's how i think i don't know if i i don't know if it's you know that way for everybody it certainly is for a lot of them so i mean when you when you get a corporate shoot in billings to go make a portrait of a doctor or something like that you're not losing sleep over it you're not sweating it if the light if you turn on your light that you're planning on using and it doesn't turn on are you gonna shit your pants and freak out and leave or what are you gonna do no i might freak out for a different reason And, you know, we never know what that's going to be, usually something new or a surprise. But uh, so photographically, you know, the first the first day of any shoot is is um, not not event. If it's an event, if it's like the Olympics, the first day is the first day. If it's something that you have to, like, go out and find pictures you're doing a story on whatever that first day you don't sleep much the night before after that you when you get into the groove for me anyways you sleep like a baby the rest of the time but that first that first night's sleep you don't sleep regardless but of you, what kind you know, of shit it's not a, and, and 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 getting out of the like if you have to like if it's like a people magazine shoot and you're going to spend like 3 or 4 days with a family that first day when you have to get out of the car get out of your hotel room get in the car get out of the car and like knock on the door and introduce yourself to your family it's just like you're just looking oh maybe i need to go to starbucks for you know get a cup of coffee and spend 20 minutes checking my email or something you're looking for you're I'm looking to drag my feet at that point. It just, but once you get into it, it's fine. It's not about being nervous. It's just like, like ramping up, ramping up for the, for the game. Because when you go into a shoot, everything you do, um, affects that shoot. So you have to, you have to, um, have everything in place and then you can't misstep. You know, it's like the 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 chef, the uh, mise en place, which you know everything has to be where it's supposed to be, so you, that you can cook properly. It's the same with photographers. All your ingredients, every tool you'll need, has to be where it's supposed to be. Yeah, but I'd say that you know photojournalists seem to be the best at. When one of those pieces is missing, they still make something edible, you know. Like, yeah, they're they're, they're the, the, the 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 photojournalists are are they're the they're the kings and queens of ap- adapting. I like to. Exactly. They, they, these are the people. These are the people. If um, you know, you show up in in Cairo. Within three days, they're going to know. They're going to know the city uh, pretty well. Like, they're going to know shortcuts that the locals might not know. They're going to know yeah. the best restaurant. They're going to know the best place that, with the internet connection, the, the fastest way to the airport, whatever they need. They're going to know that. And, and they, they, because they find their comfort level. It's almost like it's like when you walk out into your into your backyard it's like i'm in my backyard i'm comfortable i know where everything is the uh 
the photojournalists, they get that comfort level even really quickly, even if they've only been in that place for three or four days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think you nailed it too. Like adaptability is like is the skill. That's the skill that is sort of separates a photographer from a photojournalist. Yeah. I mean, but it starts with having all your ducks in a row and then you're kind of expecting something to go haywire and it does. But since you, since you've got everything where it needs to be and you have the proper mindset, it doesn't, doesn't freak you out. Yeah. You don't have to call the shoot off or something. Right. And, you know, and if you did, if you're the type of person that did do that kind of had to do that call the shoot off or whatever you wouldn't work in the editorial world that long when you know when it was when there was a thriving editorial world thriving agencies photojournalists lying around doing their thing getting paid you wouldn't you wouldn't thrive in that world you wouldn't get called back a second or third time I just got this print today. It just arrived. Speaking of speaking of bribes, did you bribe the UPS man to drive it all the way out to your house? <laughs> is that how is that how you get your mail? <laughs> we do we do have to bribe the garbage men now and then, but they still tear up their road with their five tons worth of truck. So this, I had to get credentials for a rodeo for last year. The person was like, oh, we have our charity auction. We need to, can you give us a print? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I kind of forgot. And then I wanted to get credentials to the same rodeo this year, which is like in three weeks. So I got to deliver this print so I can get my credentials. Oh, yeah, let's see it. But I haven't, this is, this is out of Chicago. And I really, I've used this, these guys, uh, I used them for a lot of big jobs, but I never, um, I've never seen the output. You've never seen it. So this you, is the first time. They would just I've, get I've shipped. I've used them to print like huge installations for, but they're always drop shipped to the customer. So this time I actually get to see one. And so you'll see it at the same time that I do. Oh, that's awesome. And this is an image from uh, the rodeo last year? It's a rodeo picture from last year that they'll be able to use for their auction whenever their charity auction is. I think I've seen that auction over there. It's like that. It's a silent auction, I think. Is it? Yeah. It'll probably, like, the print will probably sell for $100 and... You know, it cost 120. It would have been easier for me and cheaper just to write a check. But. Or maybe you just need to give that to the person that's in charge of giving out the press passes. Well, that's probably what's going to happen, right? Hey, I made a nice okay. print for you. Yeah. <sighs> I can't get it out. You're gonna have to stand up. I can't. I'm surrounded by audio visual equipment. <laughs> Looks like they did a pretty good I job packing. I don't know how to it. adapt. I can't adapt to this situation. <laughs> so, like, hold on. We'll have to cover this on the next podcast. I mean, it looks like it should just come out as a thing, but it must be like. You know, it's attached to the bottom. No print for you. This is why no one likes prints. See, they're such a hassle. Prints are the only way to look at photography properly. I'm surprised. I'm surprised you didn't make the print yourself. Okay, nice. The backing like looks. It. The backing looks nice. 
It's a conceptual piece. It's called Brown Paper Bag. Looks like nice mounting. Nice. So, I think go. I remember this picture on your Instagram. Yeah, it was on Instagram, but this is the first time I printed it. That's awesome. Looks great. Oh, it's off. Oh. I could have sharpened it a little more. It looks pretty awesome from what I'm seeing. It could be a little more contrast, but you know, it's a. This is a. This is an easy way to develop, uh, deliver prints to people because it's ready to hang. Yeah, but there's no glass. And maybe I'll sign it. Maybe I won't. I don't know. I don't know if I'll sign it or not. Maybe if they ask me to sign it, I will. If you talk, to, if I don't you actually think talk matter. to a person. Yeah, I haven't talked to him yet. I just have to show up and with bearing a gift. Yeah. Well, dude, I think that's a good spot to end. end. Okie doke. Hank just gave me the signal. We're in two and a half hour territory. And apparently my camera's out of memory card space. Good. Let's wrap it. So we're rolling on cell phone and uh, Skype video only for the moment. So, all right. Well, uh, do you want to talk briefly just about what the game plan is with this podcast and the YouTube channel and everything. Well, we're going to, you and I will talk now and then I'm going to talk to other people. Um, but you, you're kind of be going to be a constant as I talk about pictures because, uh, you're coming from you, the perspective of a lot of people out there who are searching um, on the internet for this type of information that doesn't really exist. It exists in the minds of old people like me. And uh, we haven't done a good job of uh, sharing that information with people. So this podcast is basically designed to, to share um, institutional memory that is kind of uh, being lost and forgotten slowly as as people die um that's the goal and so paul is uh paul is my stand-in for the the audience at large who uh who doesn't know a lot of these stories or a lot of these uh traditions or just uh work practices and approaches that uh that were tried and true over over the last uh hundred years or so 90 years whatever so i'm not going to ask you to subs- you also, what you also do some other interviews as well right yeah i'm going to be interviewing um my peers people i respect people that i think uh, have have a lot to share and a lot to teach other people so hopefully this will just be the first of many yeah we're going to do a lot we're going to do a lot of them so yeah, that was pretty easy. Two and a half hours just went by like that. So add some gin and tonic into this mix and we'll go for four or five hours. <laughs> it might not be as interesting towards the end anyways. It'll be more interesting. <laughs> It'll get more colorful. <laughs> not as informative. All right, man. Thanks for watching. And we'll, you and I will talk soon, Paul again. Okay. Sounds good, man. Thanks. Talk to you later.